This is MPB News. Hi, this is Karen Brown. Thanks for checking out the Mississippi Edition podcast. If you like what you hear, click subscribe, hit like, or leave us a comment if your app has that feature. Then find other MPB podcasts by searching MPB Think Radio on your favorite podcasting platform. Thanks. Good morning. It's 8.30 on Wednesday, May 5th. I'm Karen Brown, and this is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. On today's show, for the second time in three days, tornadoes tear through the Magnolia State. We check in with MEMA for the latest assessments. Then state health officials present an outlook for more vaccine distribution following reports Pfizer's shot could soon be available to more school-aged residents. Then, after a Southern Remedy Health Minute, addressing learning loss the summer after a pandemic-altered school year. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. From early Tuesday morning through the evening, residents of the Magnolia State were managing another round of severe weather warnings. It was the second time this week systems moving through the state presented threats of strong straight-line winds and tornadoes. At least five tornadoes were confirmed after Sunday's round of severe weather, and more are expected to be confirmed today after reports of power outages, down trees and debris in parts of the metro area and beyond. We're joined now by Kelly Richardson. She's Public Information Officer with MEMA. Good morning, Kelly. Good morning. How are you doing? I am doing okay, thankfully. Uh, My first and most important question, have there been any injuries reported associated with these storms? Well, I can say no fatalities at this time, but we do have reports of one injury in Clay County. A car actually hydroplaned during the storm, and the injury was a result of that accident. But other than that one injury, we are looking good across the state, other than some pretty substantial structural damage. I know that the National Weather Service has to confirm tornadoes, but we've seen pictures on social media and news stations of what looked very clearly like a tornado. Uh, Any idea how many or how wide an area uh, was damaged or affected by the storms? Well, I think probably the most substantial one that we all saw yesterday was the one that moved through the Jackson Metro across North Jackson and into Rankin County. I know for a fact that the National Weather Service out of Jackson will be sending a survey team out to that area, as well as spots a little farther south across Capaya and Simpson County, and then finally Scott and Leake County to survey a potential area where a tornado touched down there as well. So we have several spots that the National Weather Service will be assessing today. Where will MEMA teams go today? So right now we have received some requests from the counties to help with damage assessments, primarily in Hines, Rankin, and Lauderdale County. That's where we've seen the most substantial damage reports come in. So our team is going to go out there. We're going to assist in the damage assessments and also give some drone support, which further enhances those damage assessments. Does MEMA activate any uh, personnel or or methods uh, policy during the storms themselves? Not during the storms. We are just really monitoring everything. Um, and as soon as the storms move out and things settle down, that's when the request for resources from the counties at the local level start to come in. So our work really picks up right when the storms settle down and we begin that response and recovery phase. What do you know so far about damage to homes and businesses in particular? So officially, just two counties have submitted those initial preliminary damage reports to us of homes, and that is Warren County and Rankin County. There are reports of about seven homes affected in Warren County and about four homes affected in Rankin County. Of course, that number is low, and we do expect those damage reports and numbers to climb as we had throughout today and tomorrow. Um, Some reports also, although this isn't official, is coming out of Hines County, approximately an estimation about 50 homes affected, an estimation of about 25 homes affected in Lauderdale County as well. So like I said, we do expect those numbers to climb throughout today and and tomorrow. Of course, we did have the severe weather uh, on Sunday, which affected other parts of the state. What can you tell us about damage assessments there? 
Yeah, absolutely. It's been a one-two punch, that's for sure. As for Sunday, um, Hines County really impacted pretty substantially about 24 um, impacted homes in that area. And also Yazoo, a pretty substantial uh, tornado tore through the county there. And we have an estimation of about 76 affected homes in that county. And again, the numbers keep coming in from that event as well. Well, thank you so much uh, for the good information. Kelly Richardson, who is the public information officer with MEMA. Thank you. Thank you. Coming up, state health officials present an outlook for more vaccine distribution following reports Pfizer's shot could soon be available to more school-age residents. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. Hi, I'm Dr. Jimmy Stewart, Professor of Internal Medicine and Pediatrics at the University of Mississippi Medical Center. On the original Southern Remedy, we answer questions about all aspects of your health and share some of the latest medical information in the news. You can listen to the show on Wednesdays at 11 on MPB Think Radio, or you can subscribe to the podcast by searching for Southern Remedy on your preferred podcasting app. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. I'm Karen Brown. State health officers are continuing their vaccination campaign as the threat of the coronavirus still lingers in the Magnolia State. The seven-day average of COVID-19 cases reached a post-peak low of 199 cases per day on Easter Sunday. Since then, it has risen slightly and is hovering around 240. Some leaders in health care have likened the conditions of the pandemic in Mississippi to smoldering coals, a partially contained threat with the potential to stay still flare up. The best way, they say, to reduce the chance of case spikes and further transmission, vaccination. Early April also marks the peak in vaccination statewide. The number of doses administered has plummeted with only 55,000 shots scheduled or administered this week compared to over 127,000 such shots a month ago. With only about one quarter of the state's population fully vaccinated, Mississippi is still far away from the threat threshold needed to achieve herd immunity. State epidemiologist Dr. Paul Byers says rates and conditions in long-term care facilities can serve as a case study in how wider herd immunity could look. When we think about uh, herd immunity for COVID-19, I think it's important to understand that the more people that we get vaccinated, the uh, bigger chance we have to have a reduction in transmission. We may still see some cases, but we won't see that sustained ongoing transmission that we've seen in some of the very large surges that have occurred over the last year. And I think um, what's been demonstrated in long-term care settings is, um, is a good illustration where in some facilities we've achieved more than 70% of the residents that have been vaccinated. And in some cases, Um, 30 to 40 percent or more of employees who've been vaccinated. And what we've seen is although there may be cases introduced, we won't see the the continued sort of sustained transmission that we've seen very similar in the early part of the um, pandemic and and through some of our surges where we were seeing high numbers of cases in long-term care settings. And I think that that's almost a microcosm of what can be achieved once you get a high number of people vaccinated. And the more people that you can get vaccinated, the fewer number of susceptible people that you have. So you may see some limited transmission, but you really won't see that that ongoing uh, sustained transmission. Recent developments with the Pfizer vaccine could help increase the total number of vaccinated residents in Mississippi. Reports this week indicate the Pfizer product could receive full FDA approval in the near future and be authorized for children ages 12 to 15. State Health Officer Dr. Thomas Dobbs says his confidence in the vaccine has been there from the beginning, but thinks the full approval could improve public confidence. If it gives people a sense of confidence, I, I, I welcome it. I'm really glad that they're pursuing, pursuing that step. Uh, uh, you know, it doesn't, you know, the data is there. Um, the studies are there. The, the safety information is there. And now we've given almost 200 million doses. So, yeah, I, I welcome that as an opportunity to give additional people 
um, additional level of comfort, but it doesn't really uh, alter my enthusiasm. I agree with with Dr. Dobbs. I mean, you know, all of the vaccines have gone through a pretty rigorous uh, process to to um, to to provide the emergency use authorization. Although this is a, a, a formal approval, which is a, which is encouraging, and I think it, it it backs up that the data is there and has been shown to be uh, effective and and a safe vaccine. Uh, you know, we've had confidence in the vaccine, and I think that's why we have we have uh, really rolled it out successfully. The other half of the Pfizer development. Availability to some school age residents comes at a very important time, according to Dr. Byers. We've got um, somewhere in the range of uh, 160,000 or more kids that that fall into those age groups. And, um, you know, we want to get as many of them vaccinated as we can. And we hope that that we will see some some higher demand and that we will see an uptake in those age groups. Um, It's hard to predict exactly how, but I think that there are probably many parents that that are are um, uh, waiting for that for that to come out and, and are anxious to get their their children vaccinated and and certainly we will accommodate that um, I think that you know certainly we've had some discussions um, with involving middle and high school uh, into the into vaccination events and, and that's something that we're going to encourage providers to do as well as we're you know still working on formulating plans on on how we do that. Um, before the, the school ends, if, uh, if in fact we do get that EUA that comes out. And certainly, you know, that it won't stop after, after school ends. We'll, we've got the whole summer um, to, to work through to get, to get children in that age group vaccinated. So, um, and this is all in preparation for, for being able to go back to, to a more normal school year as well. And the more children and teachers and staff and employees in school settings that we get vaccinated, the less impact it will have on them. Just over 800,000 residents statewide are fully vaccinated. Coming up after a Southern Remedy Health Minute, addressing learning loss the summer after a pandemic altered school year. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. A contractor ever tell you the price of something and it sounds so high you think, eh, maybe I'll try it myself. Some jobs just aren't that difficult, and yes, you can do it. If you want to find out how to do those things, listen to Fix It 101, podcast everywhere. I'm Dr. Jimmy Stewart, professor of pediatrics and internal medicine at the University of Mississippi Medical Center, and this is a Southern Remedy Health Minute. <laughs> body needs insulin. So my question is, how can a diabetic get insulin to their organ? Your pancreas normally makes insulin, but in a type 1 diabetic, it doesn't make enough of it, so it quits working for you know several different reasons. And then you have to give somebody insulin. So you, normally that's an injection or an infusion of it uh, through a pump. Uh, and that's the way that you, you know, you, you deal with a, a lack of insulin. In type 2 diabetes, there is a resistance to insulin. It's not that you don't make enough insulin. It's that your body is not as sensitive to it as it used to be. So it's almost like for somebody who's hard of hearing and you have to talk louder, the same thing happens in, in the body when there's not, uh, you know, when there's a resistance to it. You can give additional insulin to a type 2 diabetic. That's one of the medications that we use to treat it. Uh, but it, it, it's one that you can use other medications like metformin or some of the other medications that sort of manipulate that, that hormone process. But you still need insulin, though, in some levels. So even in type 2 diabetics, it's just usually it's that their pancreas is working overtime to work against that resistance. Uh, and it's just doing the best job that it can. For more health tips and medical information, listen to Southern Remedy each weekday morning at 11 on MPB Think Radio. Join us each week for Everyday Tech on MPB Think Radio. We have an IT expert, a computer repair ace, and we troubleshoot your problems on the phones as well. Everyday Tech, Wednesdays at 10 on MPB Think Radio. Download the podcast now or listen on YouTube on the MPB Think Radio channel. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. I'm Karen Brown. Researchers find many students have fallen behind academically due to the coronavirus pandemic. 
With the summer break approaching, there's concern the normal learning loss that occurs will be compounded by students who have also struggled to adjust to virtual learning and other changes. In part one of our look at summer learning loss, we speak to Vaughn Gordon, youth engagement leader at the William Winter Institute, on the challenges of finding summer engagement and the ways students can grow through educational opportunities throughout the state. Parents, you know, oftentimes have to work and uh, if good child care is available, particularly for our younger kids, then that that is enough for a lot of parents. Um, sometimes resources are an issue uh, in terms of just access to, to quality summer programs and uh, transportation, you know, all of those things. So I think those are the normal challenges that our families and our young people face. Um, where there are good programs, uh, we certainly try at the Winter Institute through our Summer Youth Institute to host something that's valuable uh, for high school students. And a lot of other organizations try as well, uh, but we also miss a lot of young people. The high school students through that program, are is it like a classroom or are they doing other things that help them progress learning-wise? Does it have to be a classroom setting to do that? Well, you know, so for 11 years, our Summer Youth Institute has really been about experiential learning. Uh, it's been a combination of both uh, kind of uh, academic learning, particularly, you know, especially when you're learning about history uh, or systems of oppression or, or community uh, and the, the development of community. There's some processes there. There's some, there's some dates that matter there. There are timelines that matter. And so there's, there's always an academic element, but allowing them to get out in the state and, you know, travel to sites of significance, um, have the time and freedom within the, the program to have conversations uh, about the, the issues that they learn about or the opportunities they learn about. I mean, I think increasingly uh, organizations like us and others are trying to make sure that their programs offer a real combination. And I, I think that combination helps because it does maintain some of the, the skills, the hard skills of learning uh, for those young people. But it also, you know, the context is a little different. They're not in the same classrooms. They get to move around. Uh, in all of our work, we sit in circles. So sometimes that's a, a big shift. Uh, so, I, you know, I think programs increase, are increasingly trying uh, to do that. It sounds like engagement, that that makes a big difference. You're engaging Absolutely. the students. That engagement is, is really critical. My hope for our communities coming out of, uh, coming out of, or going into this summer, but certainly coming out of uh, a lot of the in-person learning that um, the circumstances have forced us into, is that we will first work to kind of create affirming and reassuring spaces for our young folks. Um, you know, so that they 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 emit through social from a social and emotional perspective, they move into the next school year stronger, um, with a with a greater understanding of their own resilience and their own ability to kind of weather storms, uh, and frankly, their schools and their communities ability to do that. I'm glad you brought up the emotional health of the students because this has been a tough year for many kids. Some have been working remotely. Some, it's a hybrid of being in the classroom physically and then maybe at home for a while. What do summer programs have to do? It seems like it might be a barrier right from the start. And how do you ease sure. them into a summer program that might be different than what they've experienced before? You know, I think we have some, I think we have some great opportunity. We also have some assets in, in that regard. Uh, Dr. Michael Cormack, who is a, you know education leader in the state and currently working in Jackson Public School District, which is where my daughters go to school, uh, he, he has talked about kind of reframing the idea of learning loss uh, because, you know, frankly, young people, uh, how do we consider the loss if they weren't taught it or exposed to it? Um, but instead, we should think about the, the opportunity to help them explore new things. Uh, as I talked about earlier there, um, having a conversation about resilience, what it is, uh, how they have displayed it, um, how their communities have displayed it. That's an important thing. But another really interesting thing that Jackson Public Schools is doing, and I'm, and I'm sure there's some other districts in the state are doing as well, 
is they're thinking about this kind of acceleration approach to learning. So rather than using the summer to work backwards to cover material, uh, old material, they're focusing on the new grade level material and using that context uh, to help scholars uh, work through what they don't understand or what their misunderstandings about that old material. Those young people will be familiar with some of the learning objectives that are, are you know, going to be there for them in that new grade level. They won't be intimidated by it. And, and along with that, some of these, you know, summer programs are trying to mix in some of the social and emotional learning, and uh, they're bringing in community partners uh, to help support those efforts. Vaughn, what can you say or what kind of recommendations can you make to parents or caregivers whose child can't get into a summer program? Is there something at home that will help move that student along so they are ready for the next school year? You know, one of the one of the biggest uh, suggestions I would make for those for those families is at this point in the year, reach out to their school districts. Whereas previously there there were not uh, there may, maybe there weren't enough programs or there was not one that fit their circumstance really well. I think a lot of districts, because of uh, the CARES Act and Rescue Rescue Plan uh, funding, they have a lot of resources. So perhaps we're at a point where we can, as parents, we can engage them to help develop the kind of programs we need. But beyond that, there are, you know, there are organizations that have been pillars of our communities for a long time, um, you know, local churches and faith institutions who, who have certainly the interest, um, you know, challenging or, or helping support them in the development of programming. Um, I am a, a big believer in the, the importance of a family and neighborhood connection. So sometimes, you know, small groups of parents can get together and create experiences for their, for their children um, that are as rewarding as anything else those young folks experience in the summer. Vaughn Gordon is the Youth Engagement Manager for the William Winter Institute. Always good to talk with you. Thank you, Vaughn. It's great to talk to you as well, Carrie. I, I want to, if I may, just issue a challenge to our to our, our state school leaders. Absolutely. It, you know, there have been some lessons learned in our public school spaces, but also in our private and indes- independent school spaces. So I want to challenge our leaders uh, to start to bring some of these folks together uh, so that we can we can glean from them uh, what what might what they've learned and might benefit all of the young folks in our state. Vaughn Gordon, youth engagement leader at the William Winter Institute. Before we leave you, emergency officials in Mississippi say four people were killed when a small plane crashed into a home. Hattiesburg police were called to the scene of the crash just before 1130 last night. Initially, they said two people had died. Now they have found four victims. Officials didn't immediately identify them or say whether they were on the plane or in the home. Police have called the Federal Aviation Administration to investigate the cause, and they're asking any one who finds debris or wreckage to notify police. Hattiesburg is about 90 miles southeast of Jackson. This has been Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. Thanks for listening to the Mississippi Edition podcast from MPB News and MPB Think Radio. Don't forget to subscribe if you haven't already. And if your app lets you, leave a comment or review. We really do appreciate it. Remember, you can always get in touch with MPB News on Facebook and Twitter, and fresh episodes of the podcast are posted every weekday morning. I'm Karen Brown. Thanks for listening. This